harkens back to generations back, all the way to the time of the Bible, when we learn of the deaths of an immediate loved one, the parent, the child, the sibling, the child, would tear our clothing as a way of sharing our heartbreak at that moment. And we don't go to wear such like with our clothing today, but we do so with the children. When we carry it, we remind ourselves that someone very precious has been torn out and kind of yeah. We can't deny that. We know the lesson of the world and the words of blessing. So I invite you to repeat after me these words. I knew you'd say it. I mispronounce everything, so bear with me. Yes. Baru. Baru. Ata. Ata. Dayan. Dayan. See, you're all ready to go. That's it, are you eternal learning?
the crash of the heavens, the prayer of the heart, the sand and the sea, the rush of the waters, the crash of the heavens, the prayer of my heart. Thank you, can't you laugh? Temporary Rabbi Alvin Fine <clears throat> writes, Birth is a beginning, death a destination, but life is a journey. A growing, going from stage to stage, from childhood to maturity and youth to age, from innocence to awareness and ignorance to knowledge, from foolishness to discretion and then to wisdom. From weakness to strength, strength to weakness and often back again. From offense to forgiveness, from loneliness to love, from joy to gratitude, pain to compassion, from grief to understanding, from fear to faith, from defeat to defeat to defeat, until looking backward or ahead, we see that victory lies not at some high place along the way, but in having made a journey. Birth is a beginning and death a destination, but life, Eddie's good life was a sacred pilgrimage from birth to death now unto life everlasting Amen El Harachaman O sweet God you have taken a beloved one from us we need light and fortitude when pain and loss assail us may we find these in you O God and in one another for Betty's love her companionship shared along life's path this continues now through the tenderness of good memories the gifts of her fine mind her creativity her goodness these are a precious remembrance to us in this time of grief we listen to the voice of sacred scripture it brings us kinship kinship with the creator and with this beloved one I invite you, if you wish, to join with me in the recitation of the 23rd Psalm. We say, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He guideth me in straight paths for his name's sake. And yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou hast anointed my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. Ata imadi, thou art with me. The faith of the psalmist in those words is echoed, I know, in the feelings of Betty's dear family and friends. Ata'imadi, thou art with them. And there is tremendous gratitude for that fact. At the conclusion of our memorial service here today, uh, we will invite you, if you wish, to succeed family as they may wish in spreading a small amount of uh, earth back into Betty's grave, assisting her with this final need, uh, what the rabbis called the chesed shelamet, the final kindness we can assist someone with on earth. At the conclusion of our prayers, the family invites you to join them if you wish today from 12 to 4 p.m. only in the social room at Point East, 27500 Cedar Road in Beechwood. In lieu of flowers, contributions are suggested to support flowers. The Blumenthal Kever Avot Flower Fund at Andre Chesed Fairmount Temple or to a charity of your choice. Of course, the family invites your continued remembrances, your loving gestures, thoughts, condolence in the days and weeks to come.
Some of you know this already. Betty Blumenthal called my office just a few weeks ago at Fairmount Temple, where I serve as one of the rabbis. She first talked with Jenny, with whom she was familiar. Jenny had been the one to help Betty along with attentive caregivers to sign on to Zoom, something she probably never thought she would do, and attend Shabbat services over the last couple of years. Jenny had also been the one to confer with Betty on the orders of flowers that due to Sid and Betty's benevolence and vision have been in the hands of each mourning family visiting loved ones in this cemetery between the High Holy Days for many years now. When I got to the phone, she told me she had something that she wanted me to see and asked if it would be okay for her to come by temple. It's important for me to recognize that she had been a member for over 70 years. It was perfectly fine for her to come by temple. Mm. This was hardly the first time she had come bearing gifts. This time it was a modest book called The Quest of the Bluebird, written by her childhood rabbi, Lewis Mann, at the uh, pinnacle classical reform temple, Chicago Sinai. It was not atypical of Betty to think of me and ask after me or bring me something, so I kind of considered the call unremarkable until this past Wednesday morning when I learned she had died. And I examined the book she gave me more carefully and noticed a dog-eared set of pages in a chapter called Getting the Most Out of Life. In that section, its author, Rabbi Lewis Mann, shared what you needed to get the most out of life. The key assets were eyes that see, ears that hear, a heart that feels, and a soul that yearns. Let me repeat the key assets. Eyes that see, ears that hear, a heart that feels, and a soul that yearns. And notwithstanding Betty's good sense of humor about the relative merits of her aged eyes, ears, and heart, Betty Blumenthal had goodness, depth, and energy to enable a great deal of these traits only weeks ago. She was well regarded in this community. Many people knew her over a long, rich life, and I do not know a single one of them who wouldn't agree with me today that Betty's soul didn't yearn. Yearn for what would personally fulfill her? No, not so much. She had a habit of yearning for what you needed, yearning for what would bring you joy and enrich your life. If it were good health, she'd try and heal you with kind words, prayers, and actions. If it were joy, she'd help you find more fun ways to do what you needed to do. The truth is the kind of soul Betty held as her own these many years is the kind you don't often meet and you never forget when you do. She'd have been 99 years old this coming September 9th, 11th. Now to shine a light on what that means, when Betty was born in 1923, the U.S. president's name was Calvin Coolidge. The movie The Ten Commandments was first on the big screen. And speaking of the big screen, a small cartoon studio was formed by two brothers that year in Hollywood, California. Their names were Roy and Walt, and their studio is now called the Walt Disney Company. The price of a gallon of gas that year was approximately 14 cents. Betty was the older of the two Gutman children born in Chicago, and she and her brother, Alan, developed a very warm bond. She was early on and remained throughout each of their lives protective over him, and I'm told he was taught by her to ride a bike for the first time. Though at 92, he cannot travel by bike or probably even plane today from his home in Olympia, Washington. Alan sends his affection and over the last period of Betty's life, his own gentleness expressed in letters he'd written to his sister even recently. And in a way we have here, Alan's own soul's yearning for Betty to have taken her final breaths peacefully. In a text he sent to Gail in recent days, Alan wrote of now witnessing a phase in his sister's life full of love and mystery and his wish for her and for all of us to find compassion and to go now beyond the limitations of our mind 
into the infinitude of the eternal. Betty's early life and schooling all took place in Chicago. It seems that her dad's death when she had only recently finished high school took her and her family to Los Angeles, where Gail lives now, and then back to the Midwest where she'd live here in Cleveland. Thank goodness that is where she'd land because so many of us have received the blessing of knowing her and appreciating the fact that here she was fixed up at around the age of 20 to a handsome, talented, ambitious, and caring young man in his father's auto supply business. Sid Blumenthal met Betty Gutman at the insistence of each of their mothers. How about that? A lesson today that you should listen to your Jewish mother. <laughs> it's like she wrote it herself. They began a love story at that time, many chapters long, joining hearts that fell to one another's heart in a wedding that, if my records are correct, occurred in September of 1944, just a few days before what would have been her 21st birthday. When Sid died, Betty sat with Cantor Laureate Sarah Sager and talked with her about the ways in which together they had addressed the challenges that inevitably come your way in seven decades of marriage. She also acknowledged the way in which she and Sid sought to seize opportunities to celebrate life and its milestones, <coughs> achievements in Marilyn's life and in the wonderful granddaughter, Jennifer, that reminded Sid and Betty all over again what they loved about raising and being integrally involved in the lives of their daughters. This has become such an asset after these words were uttered from her lips to Cantor when Betty as a surviving spouse and mother and Gail as a surviving daughter and sister soon hoped for and sought out that year when they needed help after the most traumatic loss of Marilyn within 10 days after Sid was laid to rest right here in July of 2015. Betty reminisced with Canner at that time about the places she and Sid were able to travel together, the exploration of culture and nature and humanity, going to Japan, also researching and planning and tracking down and ultimately seeing the house in Russia where I believe Sid's father was born. She loved that when Jennifer was old enough, they were able to travel with her, give them a bit of their vision of what you have to see in New York or DC or grand destinations like Alaska or the Tetons. Any one of us who knew Sid and Betty as a couple, we all have to think of the contrast of the two of them. How big he was in stature, his big voice and passion lived out loud in Betty's presence, which was no less impactful, but it was more humble, a humble spirit that would contract and expand as the person before her needed it to. When Gail and I met on Wednesday afternoon, she talked about her mom's kindness and generosity. When each of the Blumenthal sisters were born in the early 50s, within days, they were adopted into the home of Betty and Sid, and were taught from the moment they held any awareness that their coming into the life of this family was something that was special, sacred, beautiful, and a gift to their parents. Literally on the lap of her mom, Gail learned a short poem that her parents committed to memory and which she promises to teach you today. Not flesh of my flesh, nor bone of my bone, but still miraculously my own. Never forget for a single minute, you didn't grow under my heart, but in it. Isn't that a special poem? I just learned it from Gail. I don't think I'm going to forget it. It expresses such heartfelt, honest gratitude. Gail believes that her mom just assumed everyone felt that way, talked that way. She assumed everyone she encountered was as honest and as wholesome and as pure as she was. It upset Betty terribly to see how mean-spirited the public life of politics and culture have become in our world. She hated violent threats and that which has come to characterize so much of what we see in the news. Gail talks admiringly of her mom's stubborn political convictions and her still stubborn optimism that the world can do better than we are. 
That feeling expressed openly in words and encouragement makes Gail say today just how honored she feels to have been part of her mom's life's journey and to travel back and forth from LA to here, to remain a special presence in her niece's life, to stay connected with so many of you, friends and cousins, loved ones who remain here in Cleveland and who love her mom. Less than an hour ago, Gail texted me, just recalling that with all of the travels that her parents made, her mom never forgot to say how grateful she was when she returned home, home to Cleveland, where they had and lived and had built a life so precious, filled with people and things that they adored. Cousin Susan Shapiro shared with me yesterday memories that extend back to her parents, the Lewins, antiquing with Betty, both as a source of joy, but also as a way to benefit the sisterhood at Fairmont Temple with proceeds of what antiques they would buy on a trip and sell back here. Susan talks about bringing Betty homemade challah to make Shabbat more special. And of course, seeing one another whenever this pandemic could allow, at a distance or virtually outdoors or sharing blessings on a virtual Shabbat. Susan describes Betty as the classy, honest person she most wants to be with no artifice or pretense. She remembers how Betty had things to teach her long into this life. This included, and I bet you Susan would show it to you, an effective and fun way to crack an egg and get the most out of that life too. <laughs> and her encouragement that rather than have Heinen's make flowered centerpieces for Susan's most special family gatherings. Betty said, that Susan should pick out flowers she liked and just do it herself with fun and flair and not think about being too perfect. Well, Gail explained to me that in a way, that's what Betty wanted us to do today. When she would die, she wanted us to not be maudlin or share mournful tones in one another's company. We are here to celebrate her life, to gather flowers we enjoy and just do it. Make the flowers that we've gathered in life and now her completed life a centerpiece of celebration for all the days we have going forward. Are you willing to do that? I am. Gail says it figures that her mom had such things on her mind to say about what funerals and shiva should be like because Betty had long been the one to bring comfort to family members. In her upbringing, Sid could be counted on for the truth and Betty was truthful as well, but always with a manner of drawing out hope and optimism for what she was explaining. Gail remembers the way that Betty's presence shined a light on her when she needed her mom during a recovery from hip surgery years back. In Gail's direct presence, she was loving and encouraging, but later, when Gail would speak with friends, she learned that her mom absolutely was glowing about her daughter with pride and conviction in her heart. Gail knows how incredibly grateful Betty was to have loving, professional, thoughtful caregiver supporting her, working independently at her home and following Betty through various challenges to her own health and survival. Even in the comfort of the special staff members in recent days at the Hospice of Western Reserve. There's tremendous gratitude today felt for all the caregivers who've touched Betty's journey. They know the feeling that they got from her is what she gave to others. In her strongest and most well years, and even up until a few weeks ago, she was giving away gifts, like I told you. In the strongest, strongest of ways, that he was giving words and thoughts and energies and talents to the people around her. It could be something that he cooked or knit or said or did. I know that she told her cousin Susan that while she didn't know all the melodies Cantor Lappin brought into our spiritual lives, she has come to love what is new and inviting. And even in the last couple of years of 10 decades of singing and connecting with the prayers of this heritage, I have to tell you, we don't hear that many of folks in their 90s praise us bringing new melodies to our <laughs> prayers. I know that the women of Fairmont Temple, our sisterhood, are grateful to have counted her a long-standing member 
and to know some of those gifts that were her way of kindness. I also know that when in a few weeks from now, our temple will mark 30 years, 30 years since we adopted into our ark and into our life of learning at our temple, a Torah scroll born in the Czech Republic in a town that Hitler destroyed. That that scroll came to Cleveland in Sid and Betty Blumenthal's arms. So determined were they together to help it find new life and hope and not be locked away because of historic hatred erupting in the world during the Holocaust. It had been almost 40 years then since Sid and Betty were involved in an adoption. This time, it was a living Torah, which they wanted to protect, to bounce on their lap, and to cherish. And I promise that we will continually there is a teaching that inside of each person is a sanctuary where our loved ones abide. Those who once lived vigorously with us, they now live in our remembrance of them in gentle spaces like this one. When we look inside, our loved ones who died before us tell us tales. Our communion with them ennobles us through our sorrow, lifts us up in remembrance. And I think that's the kind of spiritual immortality that is our gift from Betty. Blumenthal. Let's look within today and all the days going forward and there find our precious friend, a person we knew of substance and determination, someone in whom we are proud. Until just a couple of days ago, she had eyes that saw, ears that heard, and a heart that felt. Today, as one of her proud rabbis encounters at a temple that adores her, I could say without a doubt, Betty's soul still yearns. It yearns for us to live in a way that builds our own legacy, our own kindness, our own record of creativity in this world. That's what Betty Griffin Blumenthal's story teaches us. You want to know how to get the most out of life? Look at her. Amen. Continue with our memorial prayer. If you are able to, please, if you can uh, rise, I invite you to rise on the grave. Adonai hu nachalata v'tanoach b'shalom al mishkava v'nomar amen. And God, full of compassion, eternal spirit in the universe, grant perfect rest now in your sheltering presence nor our beloved Betty, who has entered eternity. God of mercy, let her find refuge in the shadow of your wings. Let her soul be bound up in the bond of everlasting life. God is her inheritance. 
May she rest in peace. Let us say, Amen. Amen. I invite you to join with me in the recitation of the Mourner's Kaddish. These words, they actually never mention death, but it is our custom to say them at times where we yearn for a sense of whole belief. A sense of whole belief in a world where God redeems and where life is protected. We say these words slowly with affection and memory. We say, Yitkadal v'yitkadash shemei rabah ve'alma divara chiruteh v'yamlit malchuteh v'chayichon v'yomechon v'chayye d'chol beit Yisrael v'agala v'bizman kari v'imru Yehe shemei rabah v'vorach l'alam u'lamei amaya it barach, vish davach, vit poar, vit ramam, vit nase, vit adar, vit ale, vit alal, shame, de kudisha, rechu, la ela min kol birchata, vishirata, tush bechata, benechemata, da amiran bel ma vimru, amen. Yehe shlama rabba min shemaya, vichayim aleno vel kol Yisrael vimru, amen. O se shalom bim rama. Who ya say shalom? Aleinu bel ko Yisrael v'imru. Amen. Hamakom yonachem etchem. May God comfort you, each of you, all of you, among the mourners of Zion and our people. And uh, as we start to sort of take down the setup here for a moment to help everybody safely participate as they may wish in the spreading of earth, uh, uh, a reminder to drive and take care of yourself safely today. And, Make your way back to your car safely in just a few moments. Uh, uh, an acknowledgement that beginning at Shabbat services tonight at uh, Fairmont Temple, in person as well as online on our live stream, Abedi's name will be lifted up during our memorial prayers all the times over this coming month where we will say uh, Mortar's Kaddish, including at our upcoming Yisker services on Passover, we'll be lifting up Abedi's name with love. Thank you for coming. If you want to help, I just want to make sure people get a chance to Yeah, yeah, yeah. 